Welcome to Innovation Guelph Presents Toolkit, Toolkit Tuesday. Uh, I'm Mickey Campo, I'm the Program Manager at Innovation Guelph, and I'm very pleased to be hosting the call today. Uh, I'd first like to welcome our two very friendly American Sign Language interpreters, whose time uh, today on the call is graciously provided in kind by uh, the Sign Language Interpreting Associates of Ottawa. Um, or who we normally call SLEO, uh, Kevin and Dean. So thank you for both joining us here today uh, and thank you to SLEO. While I'm at it, uh, I'd also like to thank our corporate sponsors, Ernst & Young, Miller Thompson, Reese Informatica, Invest in Guelph, BDO, and Bonsai Growth. We're very ha uh, happy and grateful for their support and everything that we do. So before beginning the session today, I would like to give recognition to the land that Guelph is on. We acknowledge that many others here today may be on different territory, so we invite and encourage each of you to give recognition to the land that you occupy today and every day. As we gather for today's event, we are reminded that Guelph is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples today. As a city, we have a responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and we work. And today we acknowledge the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation of Anishinaabek peoples on whose traditional territory we are meeting. So today's webinar is called Learn to Pitch Like a Pro and Pitch Coach Maven and IG Pitch Coach Specialist Melissa Durrell uh, will help us uncover the essentials of building and de delivering a powerful pitch. Um, a couple of quick things before getting started. Uh, in case you are new to Innovation Guelph, um, Holly mentioned this is her first Toolkit Tuesday. Um, I welcome you to just a quick background on Innovation Guelph. Uh, we are one of 17 regional innovation centers uh, in Ontario, and while we are located in Guelph, uh, we actually serve the entire region of Southern Ontario, and we have a national program too, so we actually have clients in BC all the way uh, to Nova Scotia, when most of our clients are in the uh, southwestern Ontario region. However, we do uh, work with a lot of different companies all over Canada. So um, we have lots of different programs. I'd uh, suggest you visit the website for more information or reach out if you have any questions. But you're not here to hear, uh, you're not here today to hear about us. Uh, you're here to uh, listen to Melissa and learn about pitch coaching. So I will absolutely um, pass things over to Melissa after I do a great introduction and tell you who she is. Um, Melissa Durrell is the CEO of Durrell Communications. She is also an IG pitch specialist and works with lots of companies helping them raise money. Uh, she is known for her distinctive storytelling technique, which she owned at her former career as an award-winning Canadian broadcast journalist. She now uses her unique skill set to amplify changemakers through media training, crisis communications, executive communication, public relations, and media outreach. Grounded in Waterloo and inspired by the innovation tech sector, Melissa works as an investment pitch coach and over the last decade has helped companies raise more than $500 million. She is an angel investor as well, and she coaches at several organizations and accelerators, including Innovation Wealth and the Accelerator Center. Uh, Melissa's passion working with entrepreneurs has led her to launch her second company, which is Roseview Global Incubator, and she works with international entrepreneurs through the Startup Visa Program. So without further ado, I uh, will pass things over to Melissa for the next hour or so, and uh, I welcome you to uh, write your questions in the question and answer box. Um, there is an option for you to do that as you record your questions. Shauna on the call will take note of, of what those questions are and as soon as she can, she will uh, jump in and ask Melissa your questions and we'll answer as many questions as possible. And if you provided your questions in advance, we will also get to those. So, Melissa, it's all yours. Mickey, thank you. Thank you for that beautiful introduction too. Awesome. All right, here we go, everyone. Buckle up. We're in for a ride. Uh, I'm super excited to be with you today uh, and to tell you a little bit how we're going to 
learn how to pitch like a pro. Uh, Mickey introduced myself, so let's not spend too much time on myself, but I was a reporter. I worked across this country, uh, working mostly with CTV uh, uh, through uh, Saskatoon, Ottawa, Toronto, Winnipeg, Sudbury. I know lots of cities are super jealous that I got to live in, but super fun and really enjoyed that time there. Uh, that's me on a stage. I just love being on stages. I can't wait for them to come back. Uh, but that was at uh, Techtoberfest pitch competitions. And so I, I wanted to put this picture on here because look, the world's opening up again. And hopefully soon I've seen even this summer, we're starting to see some pitch competitions coming up. And so I encourage all of you to, to Google pitch competitions in Canada and maybe get yourself on a stage. You can sometimes pick up an easy five grand, 10 grand if you win the competition, but it's also great word of mouth for your organization as you're starting to raise. And the more you practice your pitch, the more confident you'll be and you'll be a pro in no time. So let's move on, shall we? So the first question that every single person should ask themselves when they're about to begin their presentation is, who is your audience, okay? So not every angel investor looks the same. Uh, majority of them, and I think probably we all can picture one in our minds, and they tend to be a little bit of an older gentleman. You know, many people are surprised when I walk into a room as an angel investor, as a, a younger woman. I like to say younger because I am compared to the older ones. But anyway, so, you know, think about who is your audience. Take a look at if you're pitching to some investors. Do they understand the market that you're in? Do they understand your industry? I mean, I tend to only invest in tech and I love to invest in female entrepreneurs. What other, like, the, and I'm just one angel investor and there are hundreds of thousands of them across this country. So take, take the time to look at the current investment portfolio. What do they like? And play to what, they're, what, what sort of things they like to see in an investment, okay? And so let's, ask ourselves three questions. You can tell I was a former reporter. I like to ask a lot of questions. You'll see a theme here. No, but write these down. Who are you pitching to? So is it angel investors? Is it venture capitalists? Is it friends and family? You know, some of us have, you know, will often start with a friends and family round. It tends to be a little bit easier. There aren't the same parameters around, uh, you know, whether they're an accredited investor or not. So are you pitching to friends and family? Then it's a little bit more of an easy pitch. Are you going to be on a stage where you know you won't be interrupted? Uh, so you're pitching to hundreds of people. Some of them might be interested in your product. Some of them might be interested in investing in your company. So what does that look like? And, you know, oftentimes I'll say, we'll build a pitch deck, but it's like an accordion. And so we change that pitch deck depending on who you are going to be talking to. The other question is, why are you pitching? Are you pitching for money? Majority of you probably on this in this webinar are uh, pitching for money, but sometimes we pitch. We might be pitching for you know two hundred fifty thousand. That's usually sort of where we start. And if you're pitching for two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars, and and you've already raised two hundred, and so you're out there just sort of gathering that last bit of funding, maybe you're pitching for a bit of word of mouth. Maybe you're pitching for a CTO. Maybe you're pitching an angel for their network. So really get clear on what that is that you're pitching for. And what should you pitch? Now, one of the things I say, and remember this, if you remember nothing else from today, is investors are not buying your product. They're buying your company. They're getting equity in your company. And that's a very different thing. You don't have to sell them all the bells and whistles on your product. What they're interested in is what's over top of that product, which is your company. And that's what we're selling, that we're selling equity in that. And what that means is you might have one product today or two products today, but what's the vision of your organization? Okay. And that's really what we want to talk about because they're buying into the vision, not just today, but in the future, those big financials that are going to be coming out years three and four as you grow and scale. So think about that. All right. <clears throat> so when we're putting down the idea of who we're pitching to, we want to write down the, who the audience is uh, for, for your pitch. So let's think about what is the biggest challenge that they have? Are they conservative or innovative? So you'll notice that some angel investors tend to stick in very, very specific spots, right? They, they like less risk, which is weird because typically angels are tend to go in a riskier space, but they want something a little bit more conservative. And some of them are like, if this is a good idea and I, and I see a potential for it, they'll write a $25,000 check. Now, those are the people you want to get to know better. But anyway, are they conservative or are they innovative? Are they money focused? And you'll know this from the Q&A that comes out after your pitch. Are they very focused on your revenue? 
you know, their revenue streams? Uh, are they focused on, you know, some people are really focused on the environment. A lot of angels are really thinking these days about how we can solve some of the biggest problems that are that are that we're dealing with on, on the globe, around the globe. And so environmental in, in, environmental tech tends to we some people say that's where I want to be investing right now. Social, right? So uh, if you have a uh, if if you're trying to fix a big social problem, affordable housing, those kind of pitches definitely tend to stick out. But if you're pitching to the right audience, so you really need to think about who they are because we when we write our pitch, we want to actually put in some language that addresses what that angel is looking for. What might be their biggest objective? Let's think about that. Uh, is their biggest objective that maybe you don't have an MVP yet? Uh, maybe, you know, so there's a little bit of leeway time that's going to have to happen. And so maybe now is not the right time. I want to write you a check. Come back and see me when you've got your minimum viable product ready. So what are some of the objectives that they might have? And what's the biggest objective? Because if we can't get past that, then they're not going to listen to our entire pitch. So we got to keep moving forward. The idea behind a really great investor pitch is not that they're, you give them all the information at once. It's that they essentially want to know more. Your job after your 12-minute pitch or five-minute pitch, whatever the parameters are around the investment that you're doing, traditionally in Canada, angel investment pitches run 12 minutes. Now, there's a UK uh, accelerator that I work at um, just inside London, and they do five-minute pitches. So, you know, you also want to be thinking about where you're pitching to. Some, you know, VCs in New York say, if you can't do it in five minutes, I don't want to talk to you. So we we need to know how much we want to pitch. And in those five minute pitches, it's almost impossible to get all the information in. And then what always drives me crazy is they ask all the questions of the stuff that you left out, right? That always happens. So don't worry, you're in in a good space here. We all understand it. But in a 12 minute pitch here in Canada, when you're pitching to angels, we're not giving them everything. We're giving them enough that they understand what this company is, that there's actually a problem, what your company is going to do to solve that. And then how you're going to make money and what the, that financial situation looks like as your company grows and scales. Essentially, that is all you need to do. It's not brain surgery. Uh, probably many of you are uh, PhDs, MBAs, and, and you know this is just simple. So don't try to put it all in there. Essentially, we want them to understand your company and be able to say, I want to know more. And then we get into due diligence. And that's when we start to actually really open up the bigger conversation. Now, in the chat, I want everybody to put in, do you think people make decisions on emotions or facts? Let me just look in that chat there. Throw it in. I want to see people. What do you think? Emotions says Janie. Okay. What else do we got? Anybody else? Emotions. Ron went, oh, look at this. Everybody up, right? Both. Good answer. Emotions, emotions, emotions. Uh, I got Douglas here with the facts. All right. Well, you're kind of right here. People make decisions based on emotions. And then they look for the facts to back them up. So if you're coming forward with a really factually based problem that your industry is that your industry is trying to solve, you may not connect in with an investor in a way that they're going to be interested. So let's think about an emotional pull, right? Uh, and, and I'll show you some examples of that. One of the companies that I loved working with was a company called Views IQ Technology. And the CEO came to me and we were working on a 12 minute pitch. Uh, He was pitching to venture capitalists at that point. And uh, he had sat, uh, like many of you, when you're thinking about the, the things that you want to solve, the companies that you want to bring forward, he spent a lot of time looking in a microscope. But what he did notice was a lot of the times people were taking blood samples from hospitals And then they had to send it to a specific doctor to have those blood samples read. So he was solving a problem where they were spending a ton of money because FedEx, Cure Later Courier, none of these are cheap, and time, because it takes time to take the blood sample, put it in the box that needs to be uh, properly refrigerated, brought somewhere so that that doctor can read it, and then they can do their diagnosis. He thought that there's got to be a way for us to fix that timeline. So we created this Views IQ technology so that a doctor anywhere in the world can look at a blood sample and make a diagnosis. Great story, really cool company. But what we were missing was our emotion. And so what we did was we found baby Sarah. She was rushed into a hospital in Burnaby, BC. 
and they took her blood sample. And because they were testing views IQ technology, a doctor 400 kilometers away in Vancouver read her blood sample and baby Sarah is alive today because of views IQ technology. Yes, it saves time. Yes, it saves money, but it's now life saving technology. And you better believe that everybody that saw this pitch remembered baby Sarah at the end of it. Now, not all of us are gonna be life-saving technology and I totally understand that, but there's no reason why we can't have our, the problem that we're solving and uh, have some sort of an emotional tug on the way that that angel investor is feeling, okay? So think about that. It's really about a great story. Now your story shouldn't get in, in the way of your business, but it definitely should be a part of how you put your entire pitch together. Now, the best pitches are going to combine rational and non-rational information. So what does that actually mean? Well, rational is the kind of stuff. It's the pain, right? We're quantifying the opportunity that's going to be in your solution. Then your product is absolutely rational. It is a thing. What's unique is rational. Our brains can get around it. Your success is so far, your traction, uh, what's in it for them, right? We always want an angel to understand what's in it for them that keeps their attention and keeps them interested in what you're doing. And then the investments, and of course, your teams, the skills and experience that they bring. Now, the non-rational, which is the part that I really want you to think about, is, you know, make the pain human. I want to feel what's going on in your industry right now and how your solution is going to be part of that larger solution in your industry. The character of the team. When we talk about where you got your MBA or where, you know, the fact that you worked at Ernst & Young, you know, that doesn't tell me about your character. You know, using words like passion and experience, that's bringing that non-rational side to what, to my brain, so it's that emotional feel to it. And why you? There's a real trend right now across our industry when we're talking about pitching to put this Simon Sinek why almost at the beginning of your deck. So you're talking about your introduction of your company, and then you talk about why you are the team that can bring this product to market. Think about it. Why you? Why not somebody two years ago? Uh, why not you know a competitor? Why is it you that is the right team and CEO to make it happen? And your personal enthusiasm. You know, uh, everyone's got different speaking styles. You know, some people have a ton of energy. Some people are a little bit more low key, but it doesn't mean that you can't bring in some enthusiasm around, you know, disrupting your market, democratizing something that hasn't, you know, that needs to be, that needs to be taken care of. So show that in, use strong language that, that can help you tell that story. Uh, you know, most of the time I'm working with a lot of computer scientists and mathematicians. So I always like to just throw this in here as the story arc, because technically I think this is, a, if we are going to take your pitch and say, this is what it looks like on a visual scale, this is what you want to go for, right? So we start off with our introduction. We move into the problem. We talk about a little bit about our opportunity and then our solution should be one of the big precipices that we're hitting, right? And then we get through the revenue, the go to market, all of those kinds of things and then we get into your team your team should be a big part of your story arc and then of course we finish off with our summary so think about this is how I want people to feel their emotions to feel if we are going to be tracking it across a graph now I always love to put this in because people say to me you know how do I keep people's attention when I'm on a stage well look it's even more depressing than you think because you only have about five seconds before somebody's brain starts to turn off and move in a different direction. So what can you say? And, and you know, so many of the time, so much of the time when we start these pitches, the first thing that we do is we start to actually, we, we start with our names. So I'm Melissa Durrell and today I'm pitching to you about how to pitch. Wah, wah. I've just wasted the first three seconds of my pitch on my name and the title. Like, what if I start about, you know, I've helped companies raise over half a billion dollars. Are you interested in the best tick tips and tricks that I can show you? More of you are going to stay on the call unless I just lost some. No, still at 47 participants. We're good to go. Okay. So remember that don't waste the first the first five seconds on something mundane like your name. Now you're important, not taking that away from you, but how can we pull them in? Is it a billion dollar market you're going into? Are you disrupting this space? Like think about a great other, like look at other pitches. What did they do that kept your attention right off the top? Oh, there we go. So let's dive in, shall we everyone? We're gonna start with the problem. 
And the problem truly is really is about making your case. You want to make sure that we understand as investors that there truly is a problem that needs to be solved. Now, I'm going to jump into this a little bit further. These slides will be available. So if you're, uh, if you're super concerned about writing all of this down, it's coming to you. It's coming to your inbox after this. So when we talk about the problem, one of the biggest things that I see as people come out is as they try to do one overarching encompassing problem. But really, if we want to break that problem down, it all, and as you saw with the last one I showed you, it was about saving time, saving money, and life-saving technology. So oftentimes, and I always love to pair the threes, morning, moon, morning, noon, and night. You know, we do this, nature does threes. Uh, great writing is all about the rule of threes. Your problem can definitely model that as well. And our brains like that, right? So then your solution solves it, this problem in three ways as well. So provide further detail of your customer issues. Who has the problem? Now, this can often be a really good introduction off the top. You know, this is the, these are the people that are having the problem right now. And then we dive into what is the problem. And, you know, typically we see it's, you know, and as I've already mentioned, it's time, it's money, efficiency, productivity, but really like you should know your, the people who are going to be buying your product or service. And so you've maybe done some surveys with them. You've done market research. What you really want to do is distill that problem they're having. And you can see my face even. Like when I talk about the problem, it's like, this sucks. I don't want to deal with this anymore, right? Like people that are, that when you, we talk about the products and services that you have, we want that when people are telling you about them, you've got to be telling them back. Like it is, it takes too much time to do this. People waste. And so here's where the emotion and facts come in. So we say people hate how long it takes. They lose eight hours a week of productivity because of this, right? So back it up, emotion, and then back it up with your stat. And, you know, you don't, I, I've seen some people who are, uh, you know, hitting all the little foot, put, footnotes across your deck. You're, you know, someone's going to challenge you on it. Make sure you've got that data to back it up, but don't mess up your entire deck with all these little numbers on it, okay? Um, so who has the problem? Why is it a problem? Like, give me some context. Sometimes when you're pitching to an angel, they are not, they don't know your industry. I was pitch coaching a, a company recently and they're in uh, uh, the cargo industry, the trucking, freight, all that kind of stuff. I know this much about cargo and freight, but I know a ton about business. So as long as I can understand a little bit about their industry, I can definitely take my knowledge and help them. And angel investors are like that. They're you know, great cocktail guests. They know a little bit about a lot. Don't go deep, but we know a little bit about a lot. I say that about journalists too. So you know, give them enough information so they actually truly understand. Cause you might be introducing them, you know, if you like, I, I see this a lot in retail or, or women's care products. You tend to be pitching, you know, 88% of angels are male. So you're pitching to a male audience about a female, maybe makeup or something along those lines. So they don't necessarily understand the problem. That's your job. Make sure you've got good emotion and stats that back it up, okay? Why do they need to solve this problem now? And of course, the emotional feeling to this, and we wanna show some numbers to back it up. Make sure you got your stat, you've got your stats. We really want them to feel that pain, which is where we go to next. The pain is really, and this is a great place to tell a story. And I always like to come back to like status quo. What's happening right now in your industry? What are people doing? How are they getting, a, how, how are they dealing with this problem? How are they getting around it? Uh, and, and make me understand that because sometimes we can even use a character. Maybe it's a customer that you had that had this problem and now they've got your product solution and that opportunity is there for them to solve it. Be very high level, but tell a great story they're going to remember. Maybe introduce me to someone uh, and then maybe at the end I get to meet them again. Something along those lines. But really what uh, we need to do here is make sure that they understand that this pain can be resolved because there's an opportunity and that opportunity is your solution. All right. So what the big solution? Oh, yes. I just have one question. Uh, is it beneficial to try and personalize the problem? It can be. So um, in the case of like, uh, I knew this was a problem because it affects me is basically, I, you know, I do hear some founders saying that I say yes, but then it has to go one to many. 
because it's anecdotal. Of course, you understand this problem because you've created the solution for it. So you can say that and then, but what you need to do then is add on. And there are thousands of other people out there just like myself who have the same problem. So as long as you quantify it as I, you know, this is why I started this company because I saw this problem, but I can tell you that there are thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of other people that have the same problem and are looking for solutions just like myself. Okay. That's how we do that. Any more, Sean? Can I keep going? Um, just a comment about a pitch recently. Um, Susan felt the slides were pretty busy for a pitch she saw last week. Any thoughts on that? Mm. Yeah, clean slides are definitely actually I do talk about slides a little bit later on. So I'm just going to highlight this one and we'll get to it a little bit later. Um, you know, there are two major trends out there right now. We'll talk about them when we get there. But I think the cleaner, the better. Look, if, as soon as I put a slide like this on, and this is an instructing deck, right? So I'm using this to instruct people so they need to get information off of it. When you're pitching your deck, you are telling the story of your company and the growth and the vision of where the company is going to be. If you can do that with a visual so that then they're looking at you as the CEO that's pitching it, we're in a much, much better place. Because you know, I'm sure you all know this, but people can't read and listen at the same time. As soon as somebody starts to read your slides, they have to immediately, they turn you off. They can't hear you any longer. So I would say as a CEO, you're far better to make sure your slides are simple so that you're the one controlling that conversation. You get 12 minutes to pitch for $250,000. If your busy slides are gonna take away from you, make them clean. There, that's my best advice. Okay, but I'll tell you more about that later. Okay, so now we're in the solution, right? This is your big aha moment. This is the moment you need to nail. And we've created this really compelling problem and the pain that your industry is feeling. So then when we lead up to that solution, we really need to remember to go back to our problem and make sure that we're addressing those problems. So here I have it that you're mirroring your problems. So if time consumption is a big problem that you're bringing forward, then you need to make sure that when you come up with your solution, that yours is time efficient and prove it. Tell me why. So talk about how your solution works high level. If there's any kind of secret sauce, uh, patents, trademarks, uh, things that you're protecting within it. I always like that because as an investor, that means that, you know, my valuation of this company increases. Um, you can do some screen uh, shots if needed. Uh, you know, I typically like to show uh, if the problem was time that your, yours takes less time. If it was about um, uh, time, money, yours costs less, right? Like, so we're mirroring what we're, we're putting out there. Um, graphics are great and you know, keep it less busy and avoid any sort of jargon or acronyms. As soon as you start to throw in an acronym, you're gonna lose people because uh, your brain will go back into its filing cabinet and try to figure out what that acronym is. Well, you just lost them for five seconds while they're trying to figure it out. And five seconds are precious, right? So we get through the problem, we've set it up beautifully. Here's our solution to the problem. And now we wanna go into what our product or service is because our solution needs to exactly showcase we get that this is the solution that's needed in our market and this is how our product does it. Uh, I love diagrams here. Um, some people are putting up sort of the dash. If you're, if you're a software company, I'm seeing this a lot. They've got the dashboard up with sort of pointers of all the things. Um, you know, I've got to try to avoid it, but sometimes it really does showcase how, you know, there's a company I'm working, a supply chain, uh, and they do all this stuff internally. So, you know, showing that dashboard and how clean it is compared to the Excel sheets and all the other things, which we said were a big problem in that industry, it just makes it a little bit cleaner. So, you know, it's really, uh, I'm going to give you some ideas here, but all rules are meant to be broken if it means that you can tell your story better. Okay. Now, what this product is, it, it gives you an opportunity to dig a little deeper. Uh, so, you know, is it, is it a highly technical product? Do we need to back it up with any other information? Um, and oftentimes here, I like to see a little bit of what the vision is. So, you, you know, most of the time we've created a, a, a beta product that's out there for launch. You know, what are the next renditions? Where are we going to see it grow? Now, as I mentioned before, this is the product that you're selling. This product is the first product. You might have 10 products over the course of your company's lifetime, right? So what we really are interested in is your company, which is where we go next. So the company is- Just another question, Melissa. Please. 
Um, just about circular economy. Uh, circular economy explanations and graphics seem to be much busier due to the nature of the circular economy. How to deal with that? Mm. So I would use icons instead of words. And then that allows you as the presenter, people can't, you know, go ahead of you. Uh, so because if you put up a big, uh, a, a big sort of roundy graph here, they're going to see it and then they're going to stop listening to you and they're going to try to figure out your graph. But if it's got icons on it, then you can address it. So this first icon is this, and this is why it matters. And it leads into this and this and this. So you're actually walking them through that slide rather than them wanting to move ahead. Now, this it takes us to the, you are, you're now finished half your slide deck, which is we want to get interest in what you're doing. So we've got our introduction, which we set the scene. Sometimes we tease the market. We've got those first five seconds to get their information, to, to get them interested in. Then we move into the problem. We've got some icons and some stats. We go to our pain and the opportunity, which tells a story that we're going to weave through the rest of the deck. Our solution, a little bit on how our product so is part of that solution. And then our overall company uh, overview. I've got traction here too, because I like to see if you already have customers or you know, have you started to reach out? What's going on in that space? And then of course your value proposition. Why now? Why is now the right time for your product to come to market or for you to be scaling your product into uh, you know, really becoming an industry leader? Because that's why we want to do it, right? So why now? And typically with the why now, you're looking for third-party validation in that space. So as a former journalist, I'll be the first one to say, that's what I look for. Do a quick Google search on news headlines. You know, we're Canadian. So, you know, is it the Globe and Mail, the Financial Post? Uh, what are... What are the third party, the journalists speaking about in your industry? And that can really point to, you know, if you're talking about how, uh, you know, work from home is here to stay, you can do a quick Google search and pull up four headlines from Forbes, New York Times, Globe and Mail, Financial Post, and it's a third party validating what you want to say. You never want to be standing up here as a CEO and sort of, you know, talking about things that people are like, I'm not sure if that's true, right? We never want them to doubt the information that you're giving out. So if you can back it up with some third party, it, you know, it's, it's just showing that you really understand your industry, which is really one of the things you're trying to do is show your, uh, your, in, your knowledge of your industry and how you're getting to it. So we've locked down the first half of the pitch. Well done, everyone. Now we move on to the second half. And really what we're trying to do here, is now we're in the cell. So we want to get to the market. And essentially the market... When we talk about the market, we want our angel investors to go, oh, I got a bit of a fear of missing out here. This market's moving and I want to write a check now. That's the feeling we want. So when we get there, we talk about your total market, right? So, and, and I see like, I mean, I don't think there are any markets under a billion dollars when we talk globally, but everybody likes to put in the billion plus market globally at this time, right? So you can put that in, but then come back and say, you know, what, what's the Canadian market look like? Uh, your Show your total addressable market in your target segment. So you know who you're selling to. This is how many, uh, you know, just for an example, this is how many, uh, if you're selling a equestrian product, this is how many horse barns are across the country and they spend this much money on, uh, you know, accessories if you're going to. So you, you go the big market and then you break it down. And what you're doing here is really educating the angel investor on what your market looks like. Now, the golden egg here is that, you know, the market that you're moving into, you're actually creating a new market, which, you know, we're seeing a lot of that happening. And, and that's, you know, that's that's the big thing. So make sure that's legitimate and that you're not just saying it. If you are actually creating a new market that wasn't there before, I think about Diva Cup is a great example of one. Uh, there, you know, there's lots of it. I mean, we didn't even have property technology, you know, 10 years ago per se. Uh, and now prop tech is a really fast growing space. So, you know, is there, is, is this a new market? And, and if so, you know, what other markets are comparable? And then we break it down so that we're really educating those angel investors on what the market looks like at this time. I love to see growth rates, right? Like uh, I remember uh, one of my mentors, another angel investor said, if you see a 30% plus CAGR, go for it. Because basically what we're saying is if this market is growing, I mean, 30% CAGR, you're not going to see it very often. But when you do, write a check. 
uh, is what this angel investor told me. So it's important if, you know, if you do have a fast growing industry, and as I said, no, like it's very rare to get a 30% kicker, but look at what your kicker is and how it's growing, that kind of thing. We want to provide proof of the, uh, of all of this market. Uh, and, 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 you know, as I said, we always want to be disrupting any existing markets too. Now we jump into the business model. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I like to see two slides here. So I'm actually talking about two slides on this one slide, but if it doesn't work, sometimes we put them in. It depends where your company is, uh, you know, really early startups tend to, we, we can put this one slide together. They are kind of different things, but essentially when we're showing what your business model is, uh, that we're essentially showing how you're getting into the market, right? So you can combine them if you don't have a lot. Uh, but essentially what we want to start to show is that you've got that flywheel. You can get the sales coming in. How are you going to get people to buy? And so as you can see, we sort of set it up. Here's how big the market is. And here's how we're going to get into this market, right? So we're telling this story on the back end of our uh, slide deck about our company's growth and scaling prospects. Are you direct or indirect sales? How, what does that look like? B2B, B2C. I mean, these are really, and I'm using acronyms here. Angels will get these acronyms. But, you know, wh where are we going? Are you SaaS, uh, sales, uh, software as a service? I mean, uh, gosh, I'm seeing all sorts of different uh, uh, ways that, that people will not, uh, that different revenue sources as well. So figure out what that looks like for you. Talk about your market engagement strategy. So how are you, do you have potential clients at this point? Um, do you have a, do you have a sales funnel? Uh, who's buying from you? Uh, so any kind of describe your sales and marketing strategies. If I see another deck that says to me, we've got a website, we're going to do aggressive inbound and outbound uh, uh, marketing through an agency. I'm just like, wow, that's everyone does that. So when you talk to me about getting into the market, show me that you understand this market and how you're going to talk to the people that are going to buy your product. Okay. And you know, typically, you know, of course you're doing digital marketing. So don't waste my time on status quo. Tell, tell me what you are actually doing that is going to make a difference. Um, and yeah, if you can show your pipeline, that would be awesome. Uh, and, and it helps if I recognize some of those. So if you got a Canadian Tire, a Sobeys, an LCBO, like throw up those bumper stickers uh, of the companies that you're working with because uh, it matters. Uh, all right, on the next slide here. Okay, so we've talked about how big the market is, how we're gonna get into this market, and then the next slide is how we make money in the market. This is an important slide. And for, remember when we thought about at the very beginning, who, what are the questions some of these angel investors wanna know? Many of them are waiting for this slide probably pretty impatiently. They wanna know how you're gonna make money. And they all know, they know their stuff. So um, is it SaaS? Uh, is it a service? What are you selling? So, you know, how do you do it? Do you have multiple revenue sources? Uh, if you do, what are the top two? Are you priced competitively? Many times when I'm sitting in an angel uh, meeting, one of the things like, I don't know whether the price you have is good. So I might even do a quick little Google search to see what the competitors are pricing at to see if you're competitively priced. So, you know, it's good to always have a little bit of context there uh, and, 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 and help the angel along with it. This is one where you tend to spend a little bit more time because people, this is a really good space for people to understand how you make money. Uh, also too, if you're pointing to a couple of, you know, if you're looking at a licensing model or something along those lines, you don't necessarily have to price it out if you're at that early stage, but you can just tease it a little bit to say that that revenue source will be coming online at, I see ad stream revenue for a lot of uh, website companies at this time. So, you know, you don't get an ad stream until you get to a certain level uh, on your, so that's not something you're going to put in until like the fourth or fifth year where you're actually going to make money off of having ads on there. So I know that, and I know very little about that space. So um, the angels are going to know that too. So if you're talking about ad revenue, make sure that you're backing that up. Anyway, needless to say, this is an important slide. There's some excellent um, uh, innovation Guelph mentors in the finance space. Uh, and I highly recommend working with someone on how you price and how you talk about uh, the, your revenue sources, because it's super important. Because as we move on, 
we get into the financials. So those that revenue that you're saying, I'm going to make this much revenue and I'm selling into this market. And financially, this is what this looks like over the big picture. Now, as an investor, the first thing that I look at when I'm looking at financials are when do they break even? Right. So, you know, you're usually looking about two, like we used to see five year financials, right? Mickey, it was hilarious. Five, 10 year financials. No one's putting that in anymore. We're seeing like three year financials. What I am seeing is people are doing like Q1 and Q3 for a year, Q1 and Q3 for the second year and on and on. So, but we are definitely chunking it in. And I think, you know, um, pandemic made a lot of sense. Inflation's definitely impacting the way our financials are looking these days. So it's okay if you wanna be a little bit more conservative with your financials. I mean, frankly, everyone's making over $20 million after their year anyway, right? That's our, those are our big goals. So uh, have at it, uh, but you need to be able to back up your financials. And when you get into due diligence, if, if the angel says, I wanna know more, you're going to have to open up your books. And if they don't make sense, they're going to walk fast. So if you are uh, putting some big numbers out into the future, make sure you can back it up. Uh, expenses. Uh, that's good. I mean, I always want to know, like, are there expenses? Are they going up slowly? It tells me a lot about what the CFO is thinking. So you get a lot of insight in, in when we're looking at these, uh, these financial slides to see you know, what kind of organization is coming at is, is looking for this kind of investment from me. I also like to see a CFO because as an angel investor, I don't want to be dealing with the CEO when I'm transferring money and I'm getting documents signed. I want to know that they've got somebody in there that understands the, 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 the stocks, the equity, all of that kind of stuff. So I always try to, I look for someone who is either they've got a fractional CFO or they have someone working with them that's going to be managing this stuff uh, as we move forward. Uh, and so, okay, so I'm going to, oh, actually, I won't, I won't, I'll go competition. Okay, so the next thing we want to talk about is who are you competing against? Now, this slide flies all over the place. Um, and typically, if you're in a very competitive industry, you might see this competition uh, after your product slide. So you might show like, here's, you know, here's the problem, here's the pain, here's the opportunity, here's our solution, here's our product, and here's where we fit in with the competition. I'm showing it at the end of the slide because, uh, you know, typically with, the, and, and so what I'm saying is you can put it where you want to. I like it here because I do feel like we've given them enough information to get them to the competition that now they can actually evaluate the competition, understanding a lot of other things like the market, uh, how, what our revenue stream looks like. More things will make sense because a big part of your competition is how you differentiate from the competition. And so if we jump in earlier with the competition, uh, we might not necessarily understand the nuances to your industry yet, the market. Uh, and you know, if you're differentiating on cost, I haven't even seen how you're gonna make money yet. So I can't, I can't actually come up with uh, intelligent answers or be able to understand what you're trying to tell me. So competition slide comes after financials the majority of the time, at least as I like to see. Show your key competitors. You know, some people say, well, there's hundreds of them, right? pick four or five of them that you can really differentiate against, okay? And, and so, you know, if you, you should be differentiating in a couple of different ways. Uh, maybe it's different with different companies. So what do those look like? I love to see the company's branding. It's a good indication for me to say, has this company spent enough time on its branding? What other kind of branding is out there in the market? Are we going to stand out? If I give this guy a check, am I a girl check? Am I going to see this company stand up against the competition that's out there? I always like to hear a little bit too about what's going on. You've told me about the market, but this is the place where I like to hear like, you know, this company just got valuated at $2 billion and became one of the first unicorns in our market. Uh, this company just did a $20 million VC, Series A VC round out of Silicon Valley. So what that tells me as an angel investor is this is a growing industry, that there's interest in it. And so if you can give me some numbers around that, like, of course, we all have FOMO. We're like, is this going to be the next unicorn, right? Like every angel, we get really excited when we see companies. Give, this, give us the information so that we don't have to be Googling. Uh, I mean, we will Google after, but, you know, give me some uh, of this information. Now, typically on a competition slide, you've kind of got that X, Y axis. Uh, so you're really differentiating on two major things, you know, cost and time. And you always want to be in that top right hand corner uh, or you can do a table. Tables are busy. 
Uh, but it allows you to differentiate on several different areas. You can differentiate on, you know, up to six or seven or even eight different things if we look at how busy that market is. Those tend to be a little bit more mature markets. Can All I right. interrupt you briefly? Um, Talk to me, Shauna. A question about competition. Do we highlight mm -hmm. monies that they've raised? Yes. If it's impressive. If it's impressive. You know, uh, what do they say? Where the money goes, focus flows. Where the money flows, focus goes. There it is. Uh, so, uh, you know, if I know that money's going into an industry, I'm going to be a little bit more focused on what's happening in that industry. And if you happen to be giving me a company that's going to be playing in that space, I'm interested. So I think it's a really good idea to, to showcase if uh, your company is doing something uh, or that, that other companies are starting to raise. It also shows that like, you know, if they're raising, they're still in an early phase. It, like if it's, if it's smaller amounts, like under 10 million, it means they're gearing up, they're starting up. So for you, that means you're in a, in a, in a new industry that's starting to raise, right? So yes, I would definitely do that. <clears throat> Oops. So your team. Team is an interesting one. Sometimes I see team uh, at the very beginning, and you'll see this with a lot of like, um, uh, I, how can I put this? Founders that think a lot of themselves. They like to put the team slide off the top. They want to showcase their chops. And I think that that's okay if you can back it up. If this is your fourth startup and you had a multi-million dollar exit on your last one acquisition, then, you know, I think that's that definitely showcases that you've got, you know, I'm, I'm interested, right? We've got that first five seconds. Maybe tell me that off the top, you know, this is my third company. My last one got acquired for $20 million. I'm really excited to be starting the next one. And I've built an incredible team to do it. Here's the problem we're solving, right? So that's a really good intro. That's going to get me interested. However, I like to think of this as one of our big, big climaxes, your team slide, because I'm investing in your team. And actually they did a really interesting survey a couple of years ago about why angel investors invest. And one of them is community values, right? They want to grow jobs and, and uh, their, their, their local economy. But the other thing is they invest in a team. So they want to see this team succeed. So this is your opportunity to really showcase why you have an exceptional team. Who are they? What do they bring to the table? Now, if you've got someone in, you know, someone who's award-winning or has worked at some incredible organization, is in incredible organizations and is bringing that knowledge into your company, showcase it. So, you know, this is your brag slide on the brilliant team that you're putting together that are all gonna, you know, be able to bathe in million dollar bills with your success, right? That's what you wanna, that's where we wanna go. So, you know, show that I always say, use pictures. Now, sometimes people are like, I don't wanna be in a picture. You could use um, an icon. Uh, but I definitely like to see pictures of the people. Uh, I tend to, you know, some people tend to invest um, in diversity. Some people are investing in uh, equity females. Uh, you know, so it's important to me to see, you know, is this team, what does this look like? Uh, do they have, you know, are, are, are they being inclusive? Uh, do they have a lot of uh, decision makers at the table that have different perspectives? Uh, that's interesting to me. Um, so talk about that. And then, you know, the other thing too is an investor, when we look at that uh, team slide, we can see right away where your gaps are. So traditionally with a lot of startups, you don't see a CFO, but they might have a financial advisor that's working with them on their team. So I'm like, okay, they've got somebody looking over their numbers. That's a great thing. Um, so, you know, if there are gaps, make sure that you've got someone or you can speak to what those gaps are. You know, it's not even a bad thing if, you know, we're, we, we're looking for a CTO and we're hoping that as we uh, close this round that we can depend on some of the angels within our network to work with us to get that CTO spot filled, right? So those kinds of things I think are important. Um, you know, the other thing too uh, is much of the time if, if the angels are investing, they're wondering if there's a board structure because the bigger the check, the more likely they're gonna wanna sit on, on your board or your advisory board to make sure that that, that money is being managed to success. So have you thought about what that looks like? Do you have a board structure in place? So, you know, you might not necessarily have to say that on your team slide, but uh, definitely have that in the back of your head because someone's going to ask you that maybe not in the Q and A, but going down the line to that due diligence. Uh, and then we're asking for money, right? So have, did you have a previous investment? Uh, did you do a fam family and friends round before you went into this angel round? What did that look like? 
uh, you know, how much equity is still left in the company, uh, those kinds of things. Now, um, you can, what kind of deal is, are, are you offering, um, you know, a safe? Uh, are you offering, uh, you know, I, I say this because, you know, technically your valuation you know, with back of the napkin math, I can figure out how much money I'm giving you to get how much chunk of your pie. So as an angel, I'm going to push you for a smaller valuation. As your pitch coach, I'm going to push you for a bigger valuation. So today I'm your pitch coach. The bigger your valuation, the less equity you're giving up for the money. Uh, and so typically what I try to do is just coach you to avoid the valuation talk and say it's up for discussion when you get into due diligence. And sometimes like what I like to see often, and we see this a lot in Canada is a convertible debenture. So they're giving you essentially a loan that they'll convert into equity, but your company will be worth more at that point, but you need the money now. You can't wait till your company's valuated at that point. So we are seeing like, a, there's a lot of deals that are being done that way. Uh, I love it when the angels ask this question because it cracks me up. When do you expect an exit? You're like, I'm just starting this company. I don't know when my exit's gonna be there, but be ready for it. Um, and, you know, typically, you know, what I like to see with it, this question is, you know, is it, do you have, is there a larger competitor? Uh, is there, you know, the big, the big monster in your market that might want to acquire you as an angel? That means I'm going to get bought out at top dollar. So I like that. Um, but if you have anything like that, it's a good idea, or perhaps you want to be the monster in your market. So, you know, uh, uh, our exit strategy would be the next uh, series B round we're doing where the venture capitalists buy out all the angels because they want to get rid of all of us. So, you know, you can speak to that. We will be doing another round at this point. So, you know, it's a real test for us to see how much money are they asking for? They're going to push you for evaluation to see if you're crazy or not. Not crazy. Sorry, that's wrong term. If you're if you're if you're living in a living in a dream uh, and then they're going to they're The other thing is they're going to talk to you about an exit. So let's think about those three things. OK. How am I doing for time? Yes. Okay. This gets missed so often. Your summary. So people just sat through 12 minutes of you pitching, hopefully, what was an incredible story and an amazing business opportunity. But when we get to the end of the slide deck, we got to remind them again of all the best points that we just put out there. So, um, you know, if, if make sure we remind them there's a real problem in our industry. And, and this, it, like, we want them to have fear of missing out on this market opportunity. There's money to be made, right? We, we go back to the first questions we asked when we started to build our deck, which is what kind of investor, who's our audience, what kind of investor are we, are we uh, pitching to? And I would say in this summary, it will change as you pitch to different people. What matters to them, remind them at the very end. If they're money making an angel, then you remind them of the money that's going to be made. If they are uh, an environmental, you know, social good kind of angel, remind them that this is going to change people's lives, right? So that's the kind of stuff that we want to get to at the very end. And then I always like, I mean, traction is the best. You know, if, you, if you've actually got some money, you're making some money in the market, remind them of that again, because they might have got caught up in your revenue stream and a few other things. But at the end of the day, you're bringing money in the bank. Well, remind them of that. Um, and then if you have a big vision, uh, I always feel like for me, I get so excited about the entrepreneurs that have this big idea. So this, you know, we're starting here, but this is the, this is our bigger opportunity. Share that with me because, you know, as an angel, we're, we're basically getting married. We're, we're getting married for a couple of years and we're going to be sharing this asset together. So I want to know where the direction you're going. And if I like it, I'm far more likely to move into due diligence with you. What we want at the end of this pitch is for them to say thank you. And when can we meet again, right? We want to get to that next, next call. So I'm just going to wrap all this up again. So there's two, two big slides here. The first one was the interest that we're getting. And now we're marketing this, that we're marketing our company. So just to run through it again, the market size. So, you know, how big is our market? What's our business model? How are we going to, how, what is working? How, how does this work? Our go-to-market strategy, how we're going to get into this market. How do we make money in the market? Here's how much money we're going to make in the market. Here's who we're competing against. Here's our amazing team that's going to kick butt as we do it. Here's how much money we need to make these goals happen. And then I'm going to remind you one more time of how amazing my company is. And then a big finish. I always like to say, you want to drop that mic like Barack Obama. Okay. <clears throat> So I talked a little bit about how I was going to tell you about deck design and timing. So one of the things that I traditionally do when I talk about timing, uh, and, and this is for the more polished 
uh, presenter. So you've, you've got your pitch deck done, you've worked on it. We've got together all of the great elements that are gonna make it a great pitch deck. And then they say to you, you know, you only have 12 minutes, we cut you off or you're gonna be on a stage and they're gonna cut you after five minutes. So what I like to do here is I start to actually do splits. So uh, I'll work with companies because I've got tons of papers around here where I'm doing the splits, the pain and opportunity split, the solution split. And I'm looking at how long you're spending on each slide. Uh, typically, I don't like if I'm doing a 12 minute pitch, you should never spend more than 12 minutes on a slide or two minutes on a slide. And uh, the other thing that I do is uh, you want your end to be so compelling, right? Remember that graph we had? So oftentimes I'll say, okay, we need to be getting into that team slide at nine minutes and 30 seconds. So I, oftentimes I'll have um, my, my, my founders with clocks all over the place so that they can look down at the clock and say, okay, I'm going to need to speed up or I'm going to have to pull a paragraph out of this one because I need to make sure I'm not rushing at the end. Your presentation is so important. You want to make sure that you're speaking clearly and concisely so that the angels are understanding what you're communicating. If you were talking a mile a minute and hey, I get it. I can talk really, really, really fast, but no one understands me. So the slower I speak, the more likely you're going to be able to process the information I'm putting out there. Well, the same thing goes with a pitch. Now, you guys all kind of understand the direction that a pitch is going. Maybe you even have your own pitches. But for an angel investor, they're hearing about you once, first time. They don't know anything about you. They don't know. They don't even know your company name, or they might have a little bit of background information, not a lot. So that 12 minutes is golden. Speak slowly. Tell the story. Be emotional. And if you run out of time, you don't want to speed up at the end. So make sure you've got a few little things in there that you can cut so that you can really land that at the end, okay? Okay. Then we get into deck design too. And as you can Just see. Just a question for you before you move forward. Talk to um, me. Should we use a summary slide in a three minute pitch or is that only for presentations nope. that are 10 minutes or more? Correct. Yep. Good instincts. Uh, but what I would do in a three minute pitch is at the very end, I wouldn't do a slide, but I would do it verbally. So I just remind them one more time, we've got an incredible market and an unbelievable team that's, you know, an unbelievable award-winning team. Uh, and we have 15 customers in our pipeline and we made $100,000 in revenue last year. We are blah, blah, blah. I'm Melissa Durrell and I'm looking forward to answering any questions, right? So you, you might just do a little wrap at the end, but you remind them of your highlights, but I wouldn't put it on a slide. So none of us can read this. 12 points, 12, 12 point font. 40 is not bad, but it's still a little bit like a little less. I like the 72. One of the things I say to people is create interesting slides. Uh, they should be visual and compelling, but they shouldn't take away from your words and you as a presenter. Uh, and really, I got to give it up for Amelia Earhart. The most effective way to do it is to just do it. I hear so many people like they're writing, they're, they're creating pitch deck after pitch deck. Sit down with a pitch script and write your script first. Then you're not driving a graphic designer crazy because you're changing your graphics all the time. Write your pitch first and then move on to the deck. Uh, and then I'll leave you with this, the presentation around it. Like I love to play with these numbers, 7, 38, 55. Most people are like, what does this mean? Well, when you're standing on a stage or when you're in, when you're, when, when I'm, when I'm speaking to all of you today, uh, the elements, what you're judging on good communication is 7% is on what I'm actually saying. 38% of what you're judging me on is my voice and my tonality. And 55% is on my body language. So think about that. If you spend 38% of the time on working on your uh, writing, and oh, actually, let's just flip that around. 93% of the time we spend working on our deck, heads down, we're typing away. And then we spend maybe 7% practicing. If you can even get that to 50-50, you're going to see a drastic difference in the way that you present. Because I promise you, the more you say your script out loud, the stronger you get at presenting. And so for people who sit there and look down at their scripts, this is not going to help you. So practice out loud. And then I'll leave you with this, uh, this one thing because you're going to get a ton of advice. And uh, I think Innovation Guelph does a really good job of giving you a ton of information. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're the CEO. So I want to empower all of you to say to no one knows your product or service better than you. So take advice, 
throw out the stuff you don't like and take the stuff that you do like. But at the end of the day, you know, none of us mentors or specialists uh, are the ones that are going to be, you know, we're, we're not the CEO of the company. That's you. So you have to be confident in who you are and what you do. Keep calm and go practice. Uh, and then a lot of people get a little bit of um, anxiety right before they get on a, get on a screen. And so one of the things that I used to do before I'd anchor the six o'clock news is I would take 10 deep breaths. What this does is it actually slows your heartbeat down, right? So you, when you get that adrenaline kick, your blood's pumping, you take shorter breaths. So if you take 10 deep breaths, you can actually slow your body down and it'll allow you to present better. The other thing that I do is when I'm memorizing a, a PowerPoint presentation, I'll start on my last slide. So uh, if I'm memorizing, I'll memorize my last slide, 10th slide. Then I'll memorize my ninth and my 10th slide. Then I memorize my eighth, my ninth, my 10th. You get how this works. What that means is you actually get stronger when you actually present one to 10, you're stronger at the end than the beginning. Most of us do this the other way around. It actually works with uh, neuroplasticity. So you're rewiring your brain to get stronger as you get to the end, which is really a great way to have it memorized. And then also to be able to pick up anywhere somebody's like, oh, bring me to your go to market site. Right away, your brain's like, remembers exactly it. Uh, and that is my pitch. So I'm going to stop sharing. And I think I've seen a few little questions coming through. I'm happy to answer any more if there are some. Thank you, Melissa. That was so informative. I know lots of people got lots out of your presentation. Okay. Oh, um, I will just turn to the questions that were raised in the registration first. Okay. Um, there's some that you've probably touched on, but maybe we'll just uh, go back and, and make sure that they're fully answered. Um, so the first question, when do you know it's the time to receive more investment? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. Uh, when you're getting investment, you're giving up equity in your company, which means you're now. Uh, so if you if you haven't had investment in the past and you're looking for, if you're wondering if now's the time for me to get investment, knowing that this is no longer your little company that you can do little things with. You're now responsible because you're giving out shares in your company that you now have to have an investor strategy. So as far as I'm concerned, the first question you need to ask yourself is for time for investment is, are you ready to have an investor strategy, investor communications? Uh, you need to talk to them on a quarterly basis. You need to make sure that your books are in an entirely different space because they're gonna be looking at them and expecting dividends or whatever that looks like, whatever you've agreed to in that process. Uh, I would also say um, you're at a point where, uh, I mean, maybe you've leveraged your friends and family as much as you possibly can, uh, and you're looking for a bigger investment. So if you're just looking for, you know, between $20,000 and $80,000, you're not looking for investment uh, opportunities. But, you know, really an investment opportunity is for someone who's like, you know, typically we see them starting at $250,000, a quarter of a million dollars. And that quarter of a million dollars is going to take your company from here to here. I'm not interested in companies that are going to make a little bit of revenue. Um, and, 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 you know, I would say, I think I can speak pretty confidently for most angel investors. We are in it to make money. Uh, and so I would say, I think, you know, time for investment, are you wasting my time as an angel? And you don't want to get that reputation either. So you need to be prepared. There's great investment. Uh, I mean, I know, Mickey, we've talked about this in the past too, knowing whether you're ready for investment well, let's talk about where you are in your company right now. What are your growth goals? Can you take your company to that next level? Which, uh, you know, does it mean, do you need to invest in some new technologies to get it there? And that investment will allow you to grow to an entirely different revenue space. Yes, now's the time for investment. So that big chunk of money, which also means you're giving up a chunk of your company is gonna get you to that next space. That's the time for investment. But knowing that you're now opening up so I like I take my hat off to people who are um, who are bootstrapping their companies because you're keeping all the ownership. There's you know, and I, I applaud you because I work with a lot of tech companies that are like, how soon can I get investment? So you know, if you are somebody who's been bootstrapping, well done. You know, do that as long as you possibly can, uh, and because you build valuation in your company as well. Your company is, makes 
is, is worth more money, the longer you, the more you bring in revenue, the more traction you're getting, the more growth you're getting. And then that means that you're hopefully selling less of your company to get m- more money. So it's a, it's an art and a science. So there's no real great answer, but I know that there's some great people at Innovation Guelph that can help with that as well. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, the next question, do we have to prepare a custom pitch per investor? No, <sighs> no. Uh, what I would say is, I mean, your problem's not going to change. It shouldn't change. If, if it does change, then you're not, it's not the right problem you're solving because your market's going to stay the same. Uh, what I would recommend though, is, you know, the, the beginning, what I didn't address here is sort of the awkward and comfortable introduction that happens when you first come into a room and we've been doing them on zoom. So you like come into a room and there's like four of us angels or sometimes three or two angels. Um, and then you come in and there's like this awkward moment where you're like, nice day we're having, right? The weather conversation. Um, that's where your research comes in. So you can say, hey, uh, you know, I noticed you, uh, you're a big fan of the Rolling Stones. Uh, I just went to an exhibit or like, you know, do your research so it looks like you've understood them. That's what I mean when you're changing your pitch. If you know that they are typically in that tech space or they maybe they've invested in a competitor um, or someone that might not be a direct competitor, but they, they've invested in something in your market. Well, you can point that as well. You're, you're familiar with this market because I know you invested in this company or you know, are you familiar with this company? Uh, you might want to not be so forthcoming, but those are, those are ways, those are the things. It's like the settles, the subtleties that you're going to put in your pitch that shows that, uh, hey, this person cared enough about me to like Google me, look at me up on LinkedIn, know, know, knows what I like. And so, you know, we all have egos. It's nice to, nice to know that somebody's, you know, trying to cater their pitch to me. But overall, I would say uh, absolutely not. For the most part, your deck stays the same. When I mean according and it out and in is when you're in a five minute pitch competition. And then you got accordion it out when you're going to have more in it for uh, the 12 minute pitch. Um, or, you, you know, you know, someone's really like they understand uh, the products. They might be a real uh computer science nerd. Well, you might want to dig in, have a second product slide where you actually show maybe a little bit of your secret sauce uh, or the patents that are, that are uh, protecting your company. Uh, they might get excited about that. So you might want, you might have a couple of little slides. I mean, almost every founder I know has their deck and then has about 10 slides underneath it, which is their appendix that they just fly up. Thanks, Melissa. You're welcome. Um, if there are co-founders, do you recommend one person pitches if a, in a five minute pitch or both? So you don't even have to stop. You stop talking. One person pitch always. I don't know where this came from, where people thought it was a good idea to have the mic handed off between people, but it's disruptive. It's also takes away from your presentation. Uh, it is, and as, as I think I said to you before, um, all rules are meant to be broken, but I will tell you right now that uh, 99.9% of the time, it should be one pitcher and one pitcher only. Sorry, Shauna, I get excited about that. <laughs> no worries. And pick um, the best one, right? Like, so typically founders have different things that they're great at. Um, you know, if you've got a male, female founder, you might have, um, you, you know, t- typically, you know, what, what, it, where do they, where can they be most advantageous? So, um, you know, I would say I would, I would leave with the female founder if you can. Um, uh, but, you know, I'll leave it up to you guys on who's, who's the better presenter. But the other founder will be there and can, can answer questions. Okay. Um, I do have quite a few more questions for you, so I'll just keep running them off. Okay. <laughs> um, Love it. Based on your experience, did you think of putting up a template presentation to investors for general use on which to build and to customize for one's application? Say that again? Yeah. Based on your experience, did you think of putting up a template presentation to investors for general use on which to build and to customize for one's application? Uh, So, uh, I'm going to make sure I understand the question that they'll, that you have sort of a, a template of your own pitch and that, that you would customize it for depending on where you're pitching. Is that what that question is? 
I believe so. Maybe Ben could um, provide a bit more input and then we can come back to that one if that's okay. Um, unless you're reading it now. Or so. he's asking me for a template maybe. Oh, okay. 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 Yep. Okay. Uh, I'll move on to the next one. Uh, as an exit strategy, could you pitch a potential acquisition to a competitor giant who can exploit your patents better without sounding too desperate? Um, no. Uh, okay. I mean, so look, a giant doesn't know you exist, right? And as nice as it would be to say like in your industry that the, the biggest person in your industry might acquire you, you got to be careful. There's got to be a line that connects you to them. Or, you know, because I hear this all the time. Oh, Google's looking for this, right? Google's going to find you. I mean, that like you're one in a million companies that gets found by Google gets acquired by Google. So careful if you're drawing that line, you're going to have to be a little bit, you're, there's actually going to have to be some facts there. Um, and it and it's not a, a LinkedIn uh, uh, conversation. Uh, so I think I would be careful about that, but what you could say is, uh, you know, this is how I would communicate it. There are a lot of, uh, you know, some of the big market leaders in our industry have put millions of dollars into research and development in this space that we have now patented and owned. So there's a potential for us to work with them or a potential for acquisition. But right now we are focused on growing this company and scaling it. So that's how I would address that. It's all in how you communicate. Great. Um, does the company have to be making large amounts of sales to obtain a buyout or partnership offer? Say that one more. Does the company have yeah. to? Does the company have to be making large amounts of sales to obtain a buyout or partnership offer? Um, I mean, no, uh, it depends on who, who wants to buy you. I mean, they could be just interested in your patents. If you have them, they could be just interested in, um, I mean, HR is massive right now. Uh, so they might just be interested in your workforce for goodness sakes. Um, there it's, it's, it, Every time I think I understand something about, uh, you know, the, the business world, something happens that I'm scratching my head at. So, you know, no, uh, does a company have to be making large amount of sales? No, who knows what, what you have valued within your company and what that other company, maybe they just want to get you out of the way. Maybe they think, you know, so there's no, there, there's a, a ton of different things that could be happening in your industry. Um, it might just be one customer that you have that they wanted. You don't know. So, uh, but that's a bargaining chip. Uh, but I, you know, the one thing I'll say, and I'll repeat this over and over again, sales are important. Everyone's going to look at how much revenue you are bringing in and what that profit looks like at the end of the day. So um, I don't, don't spend too much time worrying about who's going to acquire you or, you know, what, what that looks like. Focus on your sales plan, focus on how you're going to make money, how you're going to grow your company, how you're going to keep your team in place. Uh, Cause you know, you can hire, but Trust me, as a, a business owner, you're always hiring. Like it's a tough, HR is tough right now. So I'm sorry, we'll give it up. I'm having some issues. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I love my team. But, um, you know, so I would definitely say, uh, you, you know, there's a ton of stuff that goes into running your company successfully. And uh, at this point, keep your head, keep your head straight on. That's what. Great. Um, on a short five minute pitch, what is the most important to focus on or avoid? Five minute pitch, I would say, if I don't understand the problem, I don't understand your solution. So you got to get to those. Uh, traditionally, I would still throw in um, uh, your company slide. It might be a shorter slide. If it's a five minute pitch and you're only allowed five slides, that's a different story. But there's very few places that cap the slides. So I would do, uh, you know, your intro. Uh, a short problem, a longer solution, maybe your product company could be put into one. Um, and, and really in your solution, I put in some value propositions. So you can kind of hide it into that solution slide. Uh, I talk about your market, how you make money. That's gotta be in there, how you're gonna make money. 
Uh, and then you're, uh, you know, you could tease your team and your ask together. What can you avoid? Uh, typically, I mean, you know, I don't like to see competition gone, but that probably is the one that's going to hit the, the floor. You might be able to tease one or two uh, in, your, in your company slide. If you've got traction, it depends on where your company's at. In a five-minute slide deck, if all things are equal and you're a new startup, and that's traditionally where we see those five-minute pitches, it's, I'm totally focused on problem, solution, product company, uh, and get, you got some value prop in there too, market, revenue, team if you got time, and big vision out. That's what I would do. Are there new percentage numbers for impact of spoken word, voice, and tone, and body language in the world of virtual meetings? Mm, great question. Yeah, it's interesting these days because I do find more often than not, people are not putting their cameras on. It's like mandatory for me. I need to be able to look at people's faces when I'm talking to them. Uh, and I do think there's something to be said for eye contact. Look, I'm not going to write a twenty-five dollars to $50,000 check if I can't look you in the eye. So your pitch is the first place that you can start that. So you want to be open and, uh, and, and passionate and um, excited about this company that you're bringing to market. If I look like this, yeah, my voice sounds good, but you have no idea what I'm doing back here. So, and I also think that presentation is an important part of that too. Um, uh, I, I just, I just think it's, and, and we know it is, it's compelling. People don't do business. Uh, people do business with people, right? At the end of the day, that's what they do. So be a people, show up, uh, let them see your eyes, let them see your body language. Let them see how excited you get when you talk about your company. Passion's important. Um, you know, I do see every sort of Zoom. This is my favorite. Hi, I'm Melissa Durrell, you know, the headroom. So I think, you know, you want to make sure that you are, I, I had a news director that said to me once, um, presentation, the, the, what your goal is, is that people actually don't see you, they hear you. So, you know, wearing bright red glasses or, um, you know, something that, you know, is going to take away, you know, purple lipstick, something that's going to take away from, uh, you listening to me. So, you know, if, if I could be so bold to say, like, you want to look professional, but plain, because your words are what matter. You're not, you're not going for a beauty contest or a popularity contest. You're going for, you know, really the smartest CEO that can take this company to market. So what does that look like for you? Um, and, you know, people, we, we talk a lot about, um, you know, it, it's not necessarily a suit and tie if that's not culturally what you're wearing but it's professional, it's clean, and it's, that's what you want to look like. So if, if it looks different in your culture, do that. Wear what, wear what you're comfortable in, but we want to look polished and presentable. That's, that's my best advice. And yes, these people are still judging you on camera. I'm sure everyone's had a thought or two about my bangs that aren't quite straight. <laughs> Never, your bangs look lovely. Um, <laughs> I have about seven more questions, so we'll try to get through them okay. as soon as we can. Um, okay. I'll, I'll answer shorter. <laughs> can you please speak to pitching an underutilized waste stream where the goal of the company is to process and commercialize it through a number of possible product streams? Does one focus on just one or two? So you have several revenue streams. So I think for me, it would be what... What's the, the first question I would ask you if I was coaching you is which revenue stream makes the most money. So let's focus on that one. Make sure that people are, that, that we are, that our language that we're using and that the, the deck that you're showing that the, whoever you're pitching to can understand that first and the biggest revenue stream. And then you can introduce two or three others that are going to feed into that, but might not be your main revenue stream. Because most companies, it's not 33, 33, 33, right? Like you're typically looking at, you're, you get the majority of your revenue from one space and then you might have a few others. So tell me about the majority one because at the end of the day, when a pandemic hits, that majority revenue stream is the one you're going to be counting on, right? So what does that look like? And then you can talk about other ones. And, and um, you know, I always like to say too, like, is where's the growth too? So, um, you know, I, there's there might be a service or product that you can, that you're thinking about, 
Um, and that might be something you tease in your revenue stream to say, and this, this will be coming along uh, over the next three years, uh, which will take us to that next level. Maybe you have to be bilingual, maybe you're adding in new languages to get to another to other countries. Uh, that'll allow you, um, you know, well, maybe not new, never more, more revenue in a space, but so that's not revenue stream. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? You're, you're finding a new space that might bring you into a new target audience. Great. Um, this one's a little bit longer. Can okay. you please speak to non-tech type companies that are okay. rooted in bricks and mortar manufacturing yep. uh, where the investment needed revolves around equipment and development of a manufacturing space? Ooh, manual, manufacturing. Got it. Yeah. Um, their experience has been that most cost sharing funding doesn't fund this type of investment, even if the real estate exists. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't say that you're out of luck, but I, I would definitely say you're looking for a specific kind of investor. Uh, you know, I've seen manufacturing investors, like we're seeing new space. It's, I think especially with supply chain, like you can definitely make an argument that um, manufacturing is, is getting a comeback these days, maybe, or at least getting a lot more attention. Um, so if you are in that manufacturing space uh, and you're, and which is bricks and mortar, I mean, you're still making the same case, which is that in order for you to buy this equipment, this will allow you to grow and scale your company in a, in a greater way. That's the argument. Because as an investor, if I'm buying in at 10% of your company and that, that money is going to help you then grow by 50%, meaning my profit of your 10% of your company is going to increase. Like it's as simple as that. So um, I would say in, uh, investing you just need to make the case that we need $200,000 to get us to buy this specific equipment, but that will allow us to grow the company 6, 6x, 10x, whatever that looks like. That's the argument you have to make really clear. And then it's the investors, basically their decision to say whether that's enough. Um, because, you know, typically bricks and mortar, you know, I talk a lot about tech and that's because you build one software, you can sell it a million times, it still costs the same amount of money. So that's when we see larger profits. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a space for investors in other spaces too. And I would say that we are seeing, um, you know, with the supply chain issues that have been happening across Canada, there's been a bigger focus around manufacturing. And so there might be an argument for you to, to, to make about, this is less about, you know, that 10x investment, you might only get a 2x or 3x investment on it, better than the banks are giving you and you can help this like and go for that social go for that emotional um uh for that investor and they might be willing to you know get a better investment than they would putting it in a savings account or a tip but all right um are there long-term investors and if so what convincing do they need to invest uh long-term investing so I would say, yes. Um, when you say long term, I'm thinking five plus years. They're they're investing with you, or are we talking till death do us part marriage? Uh, I'm not um, sure, but uh, yeah. Do you know? Yeah, no. The question came in ahead of time, so I'm not long sure. term. So long term investors. Uh, so these might be people like typically you'll see like if friends and family are far more likely to do that longer term. Because uh, you're, you're kind of kissing that money goodbye. Um, it, you, you can ask an investor too, what are they interested in? Like, typically, I like to see something turned in five years. That's what I'm looking for these days. Um, but we also, I mean, angel investors, they understand as well. Like, if you're, if you're going into med, med tech has a longer, much longer runway because of uh, all the, you know, if, there's, if you're in a space where there's a lot of bureaucracy, you're probably looking at a bit of a longer play on it. Um, you know, anything uh, a founder tells me, I times by two. Um, so, uh, you know, typically what you'll see is, yeah, you can find the right person to walk, to walk that, to walk that with you. You want to make sure you really like them though. Don't take money from people you don't like, because if you are looking for a long-term investor, they're going to be with you for a long time. So that would probably be my, the advice I would give on that. But there are people out there. I mean, it's, I would, I'd safer for me or it's more lucrative for me to be putting money into private tech companies than it is into the bank right now. So that's what I'm doing. 
Thanks, Melissa. And how do you know when it's too much information when pitching a technology intensive startup, especially when it is not typical? Uh, you're going to have to ask someone. So, uh, uh, you know, turn to if you're at a coffee shop and somebody seems like they're nice and you're not going to creep them out, ask them. Hey, like, you know, pitch them your your idea. Like, uh, how techy how techy do you get? Um, uh, I would say one of the things that I would, uh, I mean, tech is hard because you do get into some jargon on it. Um, so I would stay as high level as possible. And then, and then I would throw a little appendix slide at the bottom. So if we, if they do ask for more, you've got something ready and it might be sort of like a, a product flywheel that you can show like how the technology actually works in this new market, in this space. Um, so you could leave that there, but, uh, yeah, I mean, or sometimes I do two prob, uh, two problems. So here's the biggest, here's the big problem in the industry. And then you take it down. Here's the problem with that I'm solving within this industry. Cause sometimes they can be like, I remember I worked with a company, they were 3d printing and we all know what 3d printing is now, but eight years ago, nine years ago, it wasn't exactly people kind of heard the words, but they didn't quite understand it. So we talked about like, here's, here's what 3d printing is. And there's an excru extruder on 3d printers. And that's, that's, the, that's the industry we're in. And so this is a solution for the problem 3D printers are having with extruders to get really specific, but hopefully that helps. So there's always ways to do it. Um, I'm just gonna do the last um, three or four questions as fast as we can. Okay, uh, speed round. <laughs> I think you mentioned this, so maybe you can just um, touch on it quickly. Uh, would you also spend time uh, pitching to a technology partner, example, pitching to a CTO rather than an angel investor? Uh, yeah, you could. Um, are, uh, the premise is that you want them to join your team uh, to help with CTO, then yeah, they, this gives them a really good idea. And oftentimes as startups, we can't afford to give the CTO um, full, a full paycheck that they would expect. So you might have a little bit of equity uh, along with that CTO. So you might say, and you know, I'll offer you 5% of the company and this kind of salary as we move forward. So they've got skin in the game. Uh, they might stay with, they'll hopefully stay with you longer too. Good retention strategy. So yeah. All right. Um, should I have multiple pitches at the ready for different audiences? Uh, I think all you need to do is build a strong, 12, uh, you know, 20, 12 to 20 slides uh, that really tell your story and then you can accordion them out and in. And your language can change, yeah. Do you have any tips for how you combat nervousness? A Couple of things, uh, make a fist, put it into the palm of your hand, push as hard as you can for 10 seconds. What this does is it makes every muscle in your entire body constrict when you release, your muscles have to relax. So it's a great way to get, give you that like little, uh, I guess a little spring in your step right before you start your pitch, 10 deep breaths, practice is everything. So I, you know, with some of like, when I'm, we're doing like a series A or series B and we're pitching for like big bucks with venture capitalists, sometimes we'll even go as far as like putting pictures on the wall so that I'm staring at my, whoever I'm coaching my CEO, we're looking at these pictures and we're making sure he's making eye contact or she's making eye contact. So there's a different ways. And then pitch to your mirror, keep taught. Like it, it, for you, it's about this language has to just be on the tip of your tongue. And then you'll okay. be less nervous. One last question, um, just on your view on pros and cons of zoom background options. Um, yeah. so between the virtual still background, a video, blurring your background, having your logo, all those different options. This is a tough one. I'm not a fan of uh, the, the, the backgrounds. Um, I think that I learn a lot 
from people and I, privacy is everything. And I understand that. And we're, some of us are working in our homes now. So it's a little bit of a different story. So I get that that's part of it. And if that's the case, then make sure it's branded properly and that you're, you're not losing half your head when you move forward. Uh, I'm a big, like, I am a big proponent for body using your body when you're talking. And so I find these virtual ones, like uh, my arm is gone half the time or I've got a little hand coming out of nowhere. So I do not, I'm not a fan of them. Um, dress your background to be who you are as a, a CEO. So, I mean, I've got my communications books in the background. I've got headlines from my clients surrounding me, a plant that needs water. Um, but that's sort of, so when people see me, they, oh, she's a mom. Like there's little subtleties that happen and those can help those nuances, those little things that you're putting in front of people can help close a deal. So I like dressing your background. I think it can be really great. I've done it with a few founders where they're like running around and we're putting like a guitar in the background. And then like, you know, we're like setting the scene, but it works. It, you putting thought into what the, what the background of your presentation looks like. So uh, that's what my recommendation is. But at the same time, I do understand many of us have children running around. And if you need to throw up a blocker, that's fine. Thank you for answering all of those great questions. I will turn it to Mickey Welcome. just to close us out now that it's 1.30. Can I just say thanks to the sign language people? You're amazing. <laughs> that was Kevin, awesome. Great. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you thank both. You. And thank you, Mickey. And thank you, Shauna. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Awesome. And we ended right up. I'm not going to take up much of your time. There's lots of kudos for you, Melissa, in the chat. Um, Shauna, do you have the link for the feedback form? Uh, she's going to drop it in the chat box. We'd really appreciate it if everyone left on the call could just click that uh, and fill out some feedback. Uh, give us some suggestions for future sessions. Uh, but ultimately, thank you very much, Melissa. It's been a wonderful session. Uh, lots of questions we got through too. Um, if there's any more, we'll send them your way. If you want to get in touch with Melissa or with anyone at IG, you can reach them through me or Shauna. Um, Shauna will be reaching out in the next couple of days with a copy of this recording, the slides, um, and anything else that you need to have uh, as follow up. Um, so you can just reply to that email if you need to reach out with any questions. But anyhow, we wish you a really happy afternoon. The link is in the box. We'd appreciate it if you clicked it. Uh, enjoy your day. Bye everybody. Thank you very much.